Szanowni Państwo, koleżanki i koledzy, uczestnicy i uczestniczki 17. Ogólnopolskiego Zjazdu Socjologicznego. Jest mi niezmiernie miło zainaugurować pierwszą naukową sesję zjazdu, której główną bohaterką będzie pani profesor Margaret Archer. Tego się spodziewałem i pomyślałem, że pani profesor nie trzeba przedstawiać polskiej publiczności. Jest bardzo dobrze znana, coraz częściej nas również odwiedza. Tym niemniej moją rolą jest krótkie wprowadzenie. Pani profesor Margaret Archer jest absolwentką London School of Economics. Pracowała między innymi na Uniwersytecie w Reading, a w burzliwych latach 60. na paryskiej Sorbonie, gdzie brała udział w seminariach Pierre Bourdieu, z którym notabene później nie do końca się zgadzała. W 1973 roku rozpoczęła pracę na Uniwersytecie w Warwick, gdzie w 1979 roku otrzymała tytuł profesorski. Była pierwszą kobietą, która przewodniczyła Międzynarodowemu Towarzystwu Socjologicznemu w latach 86-90. Opublikowała ponad 20 monografii i kilkaset artykułów naukowych. Jest jedną z najważniejszych, kluczowych postaci socjologii współczesnej, szczególnie nurtu krytycznego realizmu, który reprezentuje. Twórczość pani profesor Archer została dość późno odkryta przez polską socjologię. Pierwsze tłumaczenie jej monografii ukazało się w 2013 roku. Było to człowieczeństwo, problem sprawstwa. Jednak obecnie jej obecność jest dużo bardziej zaznaczona i zainteresowanie również jej twórczością jest dużo bardziej widoczne w polskiej socjologii. Jest to związane między innymi z wydaniem w tym roku przez partnera zjazdu Narodowe Centrum Kultury pierwszego tomu z pierwszej trylogii profesor Archer Kultura i sprawczość, miejsce kultury w teorii społecznej, a także uhonorowaniem jej w 2017 roku stopniem doktora honoris causa przez Uniwersytet Kardynała Stefana Wyszyńskiego w Warszawie. Wiedzą Państwo pewnie, że wydawane są Archerian Studies w Polsce. Wiecie również o seminariach mistrzowskich organizowanych przez Uniwersytet Kardynała Stefana Wyszyńskiego, przez profesora Bieleckiego. W polskim piśmiennictwie socjologicznym pojawiły się ważne głosy zarówno rozwijające teorie profesor Archer, jak i głosy krytyczne. Kiedy jakiś czas temu pisałem wprowadzenie do pierwszego tłumaczenia na język polski książki Margaret Archer, Człowieczeństwo, Problem sprawstwa, pozwoliłem sobie zwrócić uwagę na humanistyczny charakter jej socjologii, który bardzo blisko wiąże się z tematyką naszego zjazdu. Wielka dama brytyjskiej socjologii, jak pisał o niej Frederick van der Berghe, opierając się na teorii krytycznego realizmu, broni niemodnej dziś tezy o istnieniu nieredukowalnej do społecznych konwencji, ról i dyskursu osoby ludzkiej, której jaźń zakotwiczona jest w jej praktycznych i ucieleśnionych relacjach z otaczającym światem. Profesor Archer twierdzi, że istnieje tak rozumianej osoby oraz najważniejszej z jej sił sprawczych, jaką jest refleksyjność, jest warunkiem istnienia społeczeństwa. Zapraszając Państwa do wysłuchania wystąpienia Pani Profesor, zachęcam też już teraz do zadawania pytań. Przewidzieliśmy na nie pół godziny po około 45-minutowym godzinnym wystąpieniu Pani Profesor. Mamy czas do godziny 15. Profesor Archer, Margaret, the floor is yours and it's honor to be here. Thank you bardzo. Dzień dobry Państwu. And uh, apart from that, <laughs> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming. I'm going to do two things that are probably a bit unorthodox. The first one will surprise you. I am actually going to talk about the theme of the conference that I was kindly invited to. Uh, because of all concepts that are indispensable in the social sciences in toto, and particularly economics is um, in need of this, uh, one cannot do without some conceptualization, uh, a decent one, of 
the human being, the social actor, the social agent. And this is why there is so much wrong with classical economics. And we'll come on to that in a minute. Uh, but the second thing that I'm going to do that I think is um, possibly rather unexpected, I mean, from my good old friends in um, the Polish Sociological Association of the 70s and the 80s uh, and into the 90s, um, theory was not something that was evaded. Uh, in fact, going back to the beginning of the ISA, uh, it was due to theoreticians that there was such a thing as sociology in Poland. And it wouldn't have been without them. So I'm going to be talking theoretically about the conceptualization of the human agent someone, male, female, uh, any color you want to paint them. Uh, it's a global concept which has the main task of explaining why people do what they do do. Whether we're talking about going to the doctor, migrating, uh, or marrying, taking examinations, taking occupational posts. People do things. We can't leave this concept, human being, person, blank. Nor can we allow some psychologists, as they have done in the past, to say, this is ours. We can tell you about the human person. You just tell us about their social setting, their social context. Uh, that way lie all sorts of mistakes. Sorry, an hour and a half is going to be a long time, so I hope you don't mind if I sit during it. So, um, I start, and we should never keep these theoretical things secret. Uh-uh. I'd like to learn this one. Uh, No, just one. No, that's two. Yeah, I mean, I start from being a critical realist. In other words, I think when we refer to uh, an agent, a human being, we are ontologically speaking about something real something real and irreducible. Uh, and so in critical realism, we talk about different strata. We can talk at the micro level uh, about the development of the self. Uh, and there are things about the self that are particular to the micro level. For example, all of you have memories from early childhood. These are your memories as individual people. Not as individualists, but as individual people. And only you can know that you are one continuous self throughout your lives. Even though your lives may have taken many twists and many turns, some of them that you induced, others that were thrust upon you through political change, colonization, etc., etc., and now one that is facing all of us, uh, global finitude the end of the planet as we have known it. Uh, it's a real possibility. And we work pretty hard on this. So reflexivity belongs at the level of the particular person. And it is entirely up to you, each one of you, 
how much we each used to share. Some people um, appear as though they're willing to tell you everything. Even the deepest, darkest family secrets, they will tell you, they think. Uh, in fact, we're much cleverer than that. We tell people what we want them to know, very much what we want them to know, and unless we are desperate to do a verbal exchange with them um, about something where we are reliant upon them. For example, I've driven a car all my life, I don't find it particularly difficult, but I don't know anything about car mechanics. And so if I hear a nasty noise, I have to drive into a garage and I have to uh, explain in very lay person's terms uh, to the garage mechanic Look, I think there's something wrong with this car. There is a horrible noise. Now, that is not very informative to a mechanic, is it? So he will say, well, you know, does it get worse as you go faster? Does it get worse as you change gear, etc., etc., etc.? And in that case, of course, I am dependent upon him. I'm dependent on the car. And therefore, I will tend to be a complete truth teller within the limits of my technical capacities, which is just admitted are very small for cars. But if we're talking about something like identity, if we're talking about something indeed like sexuality, the editing process will be much, much deeper, sharper, we know what we want to protect ourselves from. If we're having an interview uh, with a border control official and he wants to know about our criminal pasts, uh, we are very, very economical with what we tell him. Oh yes, you know, I, um, I, I once did get three parking tickets, um, but you know, I've, I've been good girl ever since, never done that again. Uh, you most certainly don't tell him about the worst crimes that you've ever committed. Uh, so reflexively, we never forget them. Some of them may torture us at night, stop us sleeping. Uh, but with other people, we are the filtering device. We are the sensor. There are exceptions. When you're under torture, they say, you know, make it bad enough, they will reveal all. I don't know whether that's a true statement, but it has a certain plausibility about it. Then, at the second level up, up purely in the sense of what properties emerge at that level, there is, um, personal identity. And that is defined, as we'll come on to, by what we care about. Uh, if you don't care about football, then if you are lousy, if you're bad at school at football, you couldn't care less. Uh, it's only if you are bothered, concerned about something, that you even dream of moving, as it were, to the third level, the you, <coughs> um, where you will invest yourself in a particular role, wife, husband, mother, father, worker, etc., etc. Now, one of the troubles, of course, with something like identity theory is it is just so banal, it's unbelievable. Uh, some of it says, you know, because you were born in X, and X can be a country or a small town or whatever, then, you know, you share the identity of X. Absolute nonsense. We all know that we choose to move, or we don't choose to move. What we're interested in is why we do one rather than the other. But 
But in dealing with these problems, conceptualizing the human agent, um, sociology has a very, very bad history, bad inheritance. Not its fault, it came, um, well, actually, thousands of years before sociology was even dreamt upon. Uh, but let's leave that and just say that in the stage immediately preceding the development of sociology, often from anthropology, frequently towards the end of the 19th century, we encountered, uh, and I remember this when we had the ISA conference in India, um, asking some friends, we'd, we'd gone out for a walk, asking them, well, what should I be reading now? And they said, oh, Lyota, Foucault, Baudrillard. Okay. Um, well, up there, I've put up uh, some dismissive quotes from the postmodernists about the self, the foundation of the human agent. A self doesn't amount to much, Lyotard, Foucault. Man will be erased like a face drawn or child's castle built at the edge of the sea. Baudrillard, that spongy reference, that nothingness, no properties, no special properties, no deliberation, no reflection. And finally, Richard Rorty, so if we don't reflect, where do we get our ideas from? Well, there's your answer in one phrase. Socialization goes all the way down. We get it from other people. Where does that come from if we are fundamentally uncreative? No answer from the postmodernists. So that is not a helpful source for discussing the social agent. And in fact, sorry, it's the other one. Um, we have two defective models that we've had to struggle with from the Enlightenment onwards. On the left-hand side of the board, we've got modernity's man. If you want a name to put with this, it will be the philosopher David Hume. Uh, it's anthropocentric. It's under-socialized. It's pre-given. We are somehow, Hume writes, born with our passions. Passions sounded a bit red-blooded and um, sexual for the, um, many of the commentators, particularly the economists, who turned passions into preferences. And this is where we get preference schedules from. And what motivates modernity's man? Instrumental rationality. And that gives us the model that comes up in economics time and time and time again. It's there in a famous article by Becker called The Economic Theory of Everything. Then on the other hand, we've got society's being, probably the best source for that, at least the most intelligent source, is Rom Hare who thinks we are quite the opposite in every respect. Uh, we are sociocentric. Everything about us is a gift of society. When the neonate, the newborn, comes into the world, they start picking it up from society. Not from anywhere else. Hang on to that. It's an over-socialized model. 
It's gained, to use the title of one book, by joining society's conversation. It's a discursive model, it's not an active model. And indeed, <coughs> you put the two together, and Hare says, we are cultural artifacts. We are motivated by social normativity, not by what we think is right or wrong, uh, but what society thinks is right or wrong. So we've got these two models that are, this just repeats the previous diagram really. Um, modernity's man whose relations don't constitute him. He's a loner, he's a monad, um, he's an individualist. This is homo economicus. And on the other hand, we have society's being, which is sociocentric. All our properties and powers come from society. Selfhood is a grammatical fiction. From our caretakers or our parents, we learn the words, the pronouns, I, me, we, and you. And these are just what he calls grammatical fictions. I think I'm I because I have been taught by my mother to call myself I, not to say Maggie wants, as babies often do. They use a first name uh, instead of the I. But as Mouse on Mouse once wrote, as one of the most um, amazing anthropologists that the world's ever seen, he wrote something in French to the effect, um, I have never encountered a group anywhere, you could substitute tribe for group, which has not used the word I, in one form or another. This is extremely important. But Harry would deny it. Any proponent of society's being would deny it. A human person is at most a social site where things social are imprinted on, as it were, the human body. And he actually uses the geographical coordinates of Washington, D.C. to say it's that kind of geographical site. Uh, and this is Homo sociologicus. So, in short, the key defect, I'm arguing, about these two historical views that have so influenced our conceptions today are that their relations make no difference to either Homo sociologicus or Homo economicus. Reality, in other words, we don't coincide with reality. Reality does nothing to us, uh, which is complete nonsense. I mean, how could Adam and I be sitting here unless the reality of this platform was supporting us? How could you all be sitting on the, on the second floor of the, the building unless the structure was of a particular kind? But I would bet, real Zwati, that nobody sitting here has worried since I started talking about, will this floor support me? Right? There is an awful lot of ways in which we couldn't even get out of bed in the morning. Don't even ask me the metaphysical question, how did we have a bed or get into it the night before? We couldn't get out of our bedrooms unless we made all sorts of transactions with reality. And they'd be different depending upon how the house, the hut, was constructed. Um, you know, in a stone castle, you can, you can jump up and down all you like. You won't damage the castle. Don't try doing that out of a bamboo, bamboo hut. 
you will. The difference in those two realities can be the difference between life and death for you. Uh, but all the people who believe in maternity's man uh, would say is, oh yes, there probably is reality out there, not that it interests us. And yes, of course, it attaches costs and benefits to what you do. If you want to go and be a sailor, well, yes, the sea is dangerous. There is a risk attached to being a sailor. Uh, and so on and so forth. Society's being is the other way around. All reality comes to a person filtered through society's discourse. What they make of the world and themselves only derives from the social order. And you can see this happening in all sorts of respects out there in society. Uh, one of the depressing ones to me, because I refuse categorically to confuse sex and gender, they are not interchangeable terms, but the United Nations documents, every official document they now issue, their tables use gender alone. Gender's a matter of epistemology, not ontology. It's a matter of what you choose to think about your own sexuality, persona, whatever it may be. Um, biology is real. Uh, there's a huge difference, and this shift from one to the other uh, is uh, just sloppy thinking. You could call it all sorts of things, but basically that's what it is. So, what I'm saying is that reality is real. We as people who, as newborns, in one sense or another, want to thrive in it. We can't articulate that yet. Uh, but we do, they do cry when they're hungry or uncomfortable. Um, we have to have and establish relations with nature, natural relations, I call them, uh, about how much we eat, sleep, where we shelter. It's very interesting if you look back at the foundational constitutions of most of the religious orders, well, all of the religious orders I've ever come across them in, uh, in Europe, uh, how much of the timetable, the order, is given over to saying, you know, get up at this time, go and pray at this time, go and garden at that time, do not eat meat on a Friday or a Saint's Day or, or something. There's a lot more about the regulation of every day natural relations than there is about spirituality. Um, and that's really important because these are people who are trying to get away from the world by living the monastic life. And it looks from their timetable as though they are completely preoccupied with the natural world. Similarly, we all have to get on to some extent with the artifacts of our generation. Now, this can be anything from mastering the spear, the bow and arrow, to the computer. And as you all know from your own computerized experience, that increases. The performative skill you require increases from year to year. And one of the things I think that amazed uh, commentators, journalists, more than anything, was how adept the human species is at learning things like mobile phones. Yes, the young do it first, but, you know, first they, the mobile phone conquered the blue rinse ladies, and then it conquered what they call the silver tops, people with gray hair, 
uh, and two-year-old children watch cartoons on them and know how to put the cartoons onto the phone. So every age has this expectation. Ours is a technological one. Actually, when I was growing up, it was how to milk a cow. Uh, that was very important if you lived in the Peak District in the North of England. So practical relations are important. And thirdly, so are social relations. They're important, but they're not everything. Social relations doesn't tell you how to milk a cow. You could even read a book on how to milk a cow by hand, which is what we were doing there, uh, until I think I was a teenager. Um, and you've been on the wiser. It's something you have to gain a feel for. It really is something that becomes ingrained in your body. And you can watch a novice starting to milk a cow, ride a horse, um, or drive a car for that matter. It comes to the same thing. Uh, you've seen the learner driver on the first lesson, haven't you? Clunk, clunk, clunk. Even if they've got somebody sitting next to them, a driving instructor, who says, you know, gently, uh, you know, let the clutch out and push the accelerator down. Clunk, clunk, clunk. Uh, until they just catch on. But they have to do the catching on. And some of it is mighty difficult, like uh, driving an articulated lorry, yes? A lorry in two parts with a trailer, or a bendy bus for that matter. And it is incredibly hard because it's counterintuitive. If you want your trailer to go that way, you do not do that. You have to fight yourself to do that. So I have ultimate respect for long distance lorry drivers who have mastered this technique. And what this boils down to saying is that a human concern, something that matters to a human being, attaches to each of these, I divided them up into three orders, nature, practice, practical order, social order. Uh, a human concern attaches to each of them. We cannot, any of us, be totally unconcerned about nature. We may not like it, but our physical well-being depends upon it. Practice. There are many practices you may detest, but some of them you have to master. You couldn't be sitting in this hall now unless you had a fundamental mastery of computing. Going back to reading, I don't want to labor this matter. And finally, um, it's through society that we get our feelings of self-worth. Now, it's not just universities global-wide, and somebody was talking about this this morning, that are perpetually evaluating us from Pisa, right through to the abitazio. I can never say that word. Can you say it for me? Abilitazioni. We are evaluated, evaluated, evaluated. Um, more and more mm, pretenders come along and say, oh, but you know, we can evaluate you for this characteristic, that characteristic. Just open the in-flight magazines or any magazine that you buy in Relay or, or you know, one of your ordinary shops. And they're full of these, find out whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you know, how tired can you get? Um, but they've got a lot more than that. Now, all this table does is just 
summarizes what personal identity depends upon. So we have three kinds of relationships with reality. Object, object, that's us the neonate in relation to water. We've ever seen those Australian movies where six-year-old babies are thrown in, well, I won't say thrown, and dropped into swimming pools, and they float. They haven't developed enough to be frightened yet. After all, they've been living in a watery environment for six months. They just float as an object, unlike another object, a stone, which stinks. Then in the practical order, you've got subject-object. Knowledge type is practical, and it's interesting. I don't know whether it exists in Polish. We have this saying in English that some people are all fingers and thumbs. Yeah, do you have anything like this? They're just not good at manipulating, whether it's pieces of a jigsaw or putting bits of the car back together again. Do you have a saying for people who lack dexterity? Anyway, most languages do, even if it's done by circumlocution. circumlocution. It's only in the social order that we have subject-subject relationships, which are discursive. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they use words. Adam and I have been communicating quite a bit, gesturally, haven't we? Reading one another's faces. Um, but yes, discursively, we learn a lot. What's the first thing on child who can speak does, it's to ask questions, and so on. Uh, now, just look at the bottom line for a second, because I mustn't um, go on too far. Um, what role does reflect, reflexivity play in all this? Well, absolutely minimal, as far as the newborn in the swimming pool is concerned or the newborn as it gets a bit older has to learn to do is not fight the water. Just relax and it floats. But easy to say, hard for some people to do. I don't really think they understand why it is. Um, with the performative skills required in the practical order, some reflexivity does help. I remember when I was first learning to drive a tractor uh, with a trailer behind it for pay straw, etc. I literally used to tell myself in my own head, turn it the opposite way, not the way you think it should go. Behave counterintuitively. So there is and can be a minimal Oh, I'm sorry, a moderate um, input of reflexivity, monitoring how we do things. And it can be doing anything. Um, we can say to ourselves, in our own heads, uh, no, don't start writing your new article at midnight. That's stupid. You won't get very far. You won't be very satisfied tomorrow morning with what you've done. Wait till then. Do some, answer some emails or whatever else you've, you've got to do. Um, and then in the uh, social domain, you've got the maximal reflexive activity where you are, as I said at the beginning, moderating and editing and censoring what you will say, what you will share with other people. Now, the problem for humankind is that we, we all have to, sorry about that, They did warn me. No, 
it's going to go. I want the one that starts dilemma. That's it. Um, problem for humankind is that we, we all have to live in all of those three orders. Even if you're a Trappist monk, you know, the kind who live in total silence, you still have discursive relations at least once a year uh, with the master of, modest, of novices. I tell you a, a joke about that, uh, which is rather nice, because it would mean you never forget, forgot it, but time's running out. The dilemma for all of us is that we have to confront all three orders of reality. We can't say to one of them, you know, you don't matter to me at all. They can be the least important to you. People who never walk, never exercise, never look up at a beautiful sunset or anything. Um, but they can't rule out relations with an order altogether. In other words, the only solution to this is people must prioritize their three concerns reflexively. They have to subordinate some, not eliminate them necessarily, uh, in order to... Um, now, will this work? No, never mind. Uh, they have to subordinate some in order to give priority to others. And that's the only way they can live without confronting conflict with reality from morning till night. It's the foundation, I'm arguing, of our personal identities. Uh, identities don't just get thrust upon us because you come from country or place X. Human beings give themselves personal identity by becoming this particular person whose constellation of concerns is the following. And if you've done your research, you can then, because people are surprisingly willing to talk about this, or oh, I couldn't have written three books based upon the empirical evidence that they gave me, they get very generous. Because you're not threatening them in any way, and it uh, doesn't make them a worse person to say, I don't know anything about car mechanics, or quantum physics, or whatever. So, we all develop this constellation of concerns with something listed high up in our own minds, some things lower down. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is identity formation. Um, our personal identities express our commitments that define us. They express how we are engaged with the world. And our relations to events are emotionally um, transforming of our commitments. So, um, you may have noticed at the moment uh, that people are talking about, in the following terms, I must reduce my carbon footprint. Yeah? We notice this? <clears throat> Increasing. Oh, I'm not saying nobody's ever been bothered about um, having a huge carbon footprint. Uh, but um, Greta Grunberg has certainly had an impact, and good on her. Um, and that's increasing our awareness of how dependent we are upon uh, the physical world. I wish it was followed up by the acknowledgement that it's not just by giving up using 
plastic bags in supermarkets that we uh, keep to the Paris Accord of 2015. Uh, it takes a lot more than that. But our emotions do play a role, not the role that they're assuming in current sociology. I'm desperately afraid that we're in for an emotional bubble bath. Uh, this concept of emotional intelligence, to me, is just a contradiction in terms. Um, either you're, you're, the sum that you have calculated is correct or wrong, and it, it doesn't matter how emotional you get about it, it's still correct or incorrect. Uh, but emotions do uh, get transformed in the process of us transforming our commitments. So somebody who has gone um, vegetarian, possibly because of climate change, there are other reasons, um, will feel bad about himself or herself um, if they once enjoyed eating a rare steak, or an overcooked steak for that matter. Um, and the whole of our lives can be undergoing transformation of our commitments. There's one point where I'm very close to Charles Taylor who says very much the same thing and even closer to the novelist. Now, I'll stop this if nobody's read it. Have you got a translation of Graham Greene, The Power and the Glory? No? Okay, well, make a note of it and go away and watch the transformations that overcome uh, this well-fed uh, parish priest whose life isn't very demanding. Uh, until he has to undergo martyrdom. And note the things that he condemns that once upon a time he celebrated about himself. It's a brilliant novel. So what we're trying to do is to realize our ultimate concerns, those things that are top of our lists of priorities, um, <clears throat> but not reject the others because we can't reject them entirely. So our task is to try and design for ourselves or ourselves and our partner or our family or our local community a way of life that is both satisfactory to us and sustainable. Um, now, the satisfactory is very difficult because uh, something terrible can happen, like the hurricane that happened last week um, in the West Indian Islands. Um, you know, somebody could have spent a lifetime building a boat and maybe somewhere where they could um, cure meat, and, sorry, cure fish, smoke fish, provide food for the winter. Suddenly it's wiped out by a natural event. Sometimes the event isn't natural at all. I don't need, wouldn't dream of sitting here in Poland and talking about invasion. You know perfectly well how that can disturb many satisfactory lives and make them completely unsustainable. And of course, one of the interests about sustainability is one of the interests behind mobility studies. Why do, it's fine. Why do some people um, seem to go on very smoothly Whereas others uh, find that they're getting bored with their occupation, or and this is this is very sad when you you read about 
Olympic athletes. Because within my lifetime, the ages have got younger and younger and younger, at which their sporting careers are over. Now it said, oh, but you know, she's 32. Forget being a gymnast, you've got to be 14, and so on and so forth. Well, age happens to all of us, and many of the things that made us the people we are, like uh, the sports we enjoy, for example, some of us enjoy, uh, become impossible in extreme old age and um, with certain medical conditions at any age. Um, but, but that shouldn't lead us into the trap of assuming, reifying retirement, which to me is a filthy word. If you're in good health and you enjoy what you do, go on to in doing what you enjoy. There's no law that says you have to retire at 60, or for heaven's sake, 50. What are they going to do with the 40 years demographically um, assigned to them, certainly by probability theory. So, we have um, personal identity and the generic difficulties of sustaining it. Now, I'm going to jump over that bit and bring us to the the end, because I think I can use four minutes, can I, to conclude, that um, it's uh, an invented diagram which has its limitations as in any attempt to reproduce graphically um, what one said analytically. But this is the um, the task of the newborn. So, I divided up into individual, collective dimension, public, private dimension. Right, the individual starts here, acquires an eye. Um, through, and the self, crucially, through, not just because the mother says I, in fact, the mother will only say I when she's talking about herself. She won't say it when she's talking about her infant. Um, and this self starts off it's a voyage of exploration, of reality, of the whole of the real world. And it is just like geographical exploring. Um, yes, they are put in a bed, a cot, or whatever the local equivalent is. They didn't make it, but it's they themselves who experience the pain if they roll over and their body is pushing against the side of, let's call it a cot, berceau, um, um, the, the normal thing. And as it gets a bit older, it will learn that it can use its physical abilities to get rid of that pain. It's it's pain, nobody else can share it, it's extraordinarily private. It's like going to the dentist, you know, I'm in, I'm dentist, I'm in pain. What kind of pain is a dentist? Well, you know, that, um, that sort of nagging, dull ache, and the dentist um, sort of makes, uh-huh. You know, one of those noises that means absolutely nothing. Just shut up and let's get on with it. Um, and 
you know, wouldn't it be a lot easier if these things like pain could be shared? If the dentist was there and I could just hand him the tooth, say, that's it, have that for a minute and you'll know exactly what pain I'm experiencing. Can't be done. Only one head that we can ever know from the inside, ours, but it does one hell of a lot of work for us. One of the jobs it does is as I becomes more prominent, and I'm sure you've heard them, I'm sure it happens in supermarkets in the city, just like it does anywhere else in Europe. The child from hell that you don't want to be queuing up behind. I want, I want, I want a chocolate bar. I want a, yeah, it's learnt the word I. There's no problem about that. What's much more interesting is not that it's clamoring for chocolate bars and um, some of the more unscrupulous supermarkets are putting these at the checkout so that the kid will grab it and the mother will say, oh, go on, I've had enough. I'll have the chocolate bar. Um, what's important is that the eye that's now developed is on a real voyage of discovery. What sort of me am I? Now, what do I mean by this? Not something deep, meaningful and mystical. Uh, but questions that kids put to their parents and to one another, and above all, to themselves. Why can't I have a bike? Why can't I have a computer? Why can't we go to Disneyland? And of course, the last thing a parent wants to say is because we're poor, because we can't afford it. Um, it's not that the parents don't work hard, they probably work harder than the um, population's average. But the me, how that child is situated in the stratification of that society, in the distribution of social um, scarce goods, uh, in relation to their peers, why can she have a bike and I can't even have a birthday party? Why do they live in a big house and we can't even have the, the roof mended? They learn in their own terms all about as Weber would have put it, class, status, and power. And that's what I call their primary agency. Uh, it carves out, it being the natural and social processes put together, they carve out groups with similar life chances. And these will extend as far as the projected uh, I'm taking life chances seriously. I'm not sure they would took it quite so um, basically. It will determine collectively, arithmetically, um, their longevity, how long they're likely to live. Um, and mm, interestingly, this has been going up in Europe for us year on year on year. It's now just peaked, and it's on a downward slope. At least it is in uh, the UK. Those are the only figures I've seen. I'm told it's similar in France, but I can't vouch for that. And then they go through primary school, um, and notions of the me and what's available to the me become the sorts of things that sociologists get really interested in. Performance rates, uh, who gets through selective examinations, 
who gains access to university, who has the resources to stay on and do postgrad degree, etc., etc. That's one of the ways in which the we develop. We are a form of corporate agency. We belong to associations. We're quite willing to tell any investigator, yes, I'm a member of the Polish Sociological Association, or British Sociological Association, International Sociological Association, and maybe all sorts of other associations. Now, these are the people that we electively choose to work with. And it includes things like political parties, a political dimension. It obviously includes what importance you attach to being somewhere on the rich-poor dimension. Do you join uh, a party that um, seeks greater equality? Or do you join a party that protects elite status? Or do you try and have the best of both worlds and join a centrist party or coalition? But corporate agents are the ones that really occupy institutional roles of command. And finally, we end up with the individual you that each one of us has to choose and then make become. You don't, you don't get made a professor. You do, in one sense. But not unless you've done an awful lot of the making. Uh, and then, well, with making, there is usually breaking. And so this is where I'm going to end, that, um, you know, you can have struggled all your life to occupy a particular role. We'll just call it full professor. You can have been envious, you can have been really horrible when you were younger to people who had it and you didn't. And it was probably just a matter of age. You both probably wrote completely mediocre articles. Neither of you should have had it in a really just world, but it isn't. Uh, and so on. And that, I suppose, if you did enough interviews and were a good interviewer, and that's not given to anybody, everybody, it's a performative skill like every other, um, that would tell you a lot about the individual as a self, a primary agent, a corporate agent, and an actor. And unless we can make these distinctions, we won't understand what people do, and we won't understand how some Similar events or the same identical event. I knew I couldn't get through an hour's lecture without using this word. Some of our worlds in Britain are being broken by Brexit. Some other people are absolutely indifferent and just say, let's get all of this over with. Two very different social agents. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, Professor Archer, for an uh, excellent uh, talk, which uh, really gave us a framework for our discussions uh, over the next uh, four days, I think. E, szanowni Państwo, e, myślę, że to jest czas na zadawanie pytań. E, proponuję w ten sposób to zorganizować, że zbierzemy e, dwa, trzy pytania, e, może bardziej trzy niż dwa. E, proszę się przedstawić, jeżeli można na początku, e, no i 
albo komentarz, albo pytanie zadać. Wolontariusze są na sali, jak rozumiem, z mikrofonami podejdą. Pytanie tam. Jedno tam, tam drugie. Okay. Proszę. Okay. Przedstawić się. Piotr Pawliszak, Uniwersytet Gdański. Um, I'd like to ask about um, reflexivity. Um, what do you... Uh, What do you think about measuring reflexivity, such different things as for instance the reflexivity of ants as a, uh, as a kind of quasi-social or social things, or something like um, reflexivity of um, communities of different species. Um, okay, I, I don't know, this, in English I mean some species like I mean, in insects, they have a special colony of, uh, of um, mushrooms and they feed them and then, you know, it's a kind of cooperation and, and it's not just, um, you know, the moment cooperation, it, it had to start at some day and evolved. So there is a kind, for me, it's a kind of reflexivity very specific. And also, you know, our human reflexivity as single human, and also, for instance, social reflexivity as, for instance, the reflexivity of nation. I think there is some kind of reflexivity, I hope. Thank you, dziękuję. Tam było pytanie. Danuta Zalewska, Uniwersytet Wrocławski. Ja mam takie pytanie troszkę wykraczające poza indywidualistyczne i bardzo humanistyczne podejście do tożsamości. Pani profesor, no sprawczość jest jakby podstawą działania społecznego. I e, e, ostatnie badania nad, e, pani profesor wspominała, żebyśmy nie unikali interdyscyplinarności. W związku z tym ostatnie badania neuropsychologiczne pokazują, że człowiek funkcjonuje poznawczo w 11 wymiarach. Mieliśmy tutaj propozycję trzech wymiarów. Podejrzewam, że mamy przed sobą jeszcze daleką drogę do poznania tożsamości. Następna uwaga jest taka, że badania psychologiczne pokazują, iż człowiek funkcjonuje w permanentnym dysonansie poznawczym i tylko tak działa. W związku z tym mamy ograniczoną racjonalność i mamy emocjonalność związaną z tą racjonalnością ograniczaną przez ten dylemat poznawczy ciągły. Co w związku z tym, z tą tożsamością? Trzecia, trzeci kierunek badań, który jest aktualne, to są badania nad tym, że od początku człowiek poznaje, antycypując przyszłość. Działa tylko tak, jak jest w stanie skonstruować wizję przyszłości dla swojego działania. A więc jednostka byłaby jednostką antycypującą i tożsamość byłaby budowana w oparciu o antycypację. 
Obecnie mamy dylemat podstawowy, mianowicie człowiek jako byt, jako jednostka ulega deformacji, to znaczy deformacji niewartościująco, przepraszam za to określenie, tylko e, zmienia się w różnych kierunkach cyborgizacja, przyspieszona ewolucja, implantacja, e, hybrydyzacja i jeszcze inne e, procedury, które zmieniają człowieka jako podmiot również ponieważ zmieniają go i organicznie, i neurologicznie, a więc i psychicznie. Do tego dochodzi nam problematyka AL, to znaczy relacji ze sztuczną inteligencją i ograniczonej racjonalności, nie dlatego, że Bordier powiedział, że człowiek jest ograniczony racjonalnie, tylko dlatego, że nam świat, który stworzy, tworzymy, ogranicza nasze wybory i naszą racjonalność. Jak wtedy w związku z tym badać tę tożsamość, jakby ewentualnie wyglądały te struktury, które pani profesor proponuje. Dziękuję. Dziękuję bardzo. Może jeszcze jedno ostatnie pytanie na teraz, jeżeli jest w sali. Aha. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jan Kubik from Rutgers and University College London. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Archer, for this uh, really, really great uh, lecture. Uh, I have two basic questions. Um, one is, um, at the beginning, you uh, very usefully outlined homo sociologicus and homo economicus idea, and then I was expecting that you will provide some kind of useful summary what critical realism uh, gives us as a solution. And I, I know you, you hinted at several ways, but if you would kind of summarize in whatever, a sentence or two, what is the main gain we have from uh, using critical realism versus the two other versions, uh, uh, visions or, or theories? Um, second, the second question is about power, the dimension of power. Uh, in this last uh, uh, slide with four quadrants, uh, I, I think it's very useful and it, 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 it convinces me, but uh, how would you think, how do you think about the, the power dimension as, uh, in this progress? How you think about how it is uh, sort of realized, how, what role it plays and how in each of the four stages, very briefly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think three uh, good questions. I, I, I think it's time to answer them now. So if you could. <laughs> May I work backwards, because it's, um, it's easier to remember that way. Um, so, yes, I think we're on very similar lines, and it's a very fair question to say what's the payoff from using critical realism to look at this problem. Well, the payoff is simply that you, through accepting emergence, and there are a few theories, such as um, complexity theory, etc., cetera, um, that reject emergence, which only 10 years ago used to be controversial. Now it's, it's virtually ceased to be, and it's the main plank of critical realism. Um, so, the existence of these different properties and causal powers at, at different levels has ceased to be contested. And in a way, the contestation has changed to the other side. And we're asking the economists, you know, how on earth can you produce an economic theory of everything? How on earth can you uh, explain in terms of instrumental rationality, uh, why X marries Y or cohabits with, with Y. Uh, and the answer has to be um, in terms of um, economic utility. 
Uh, so, uh, what can we do? Uh, many of the writers in heterodox economics say, what can we do about the fact, and Adam Smith recognized this, that we are also a benevolent people. We don't like seeing suffering, and insofar as there is one of these dramatic events, um, such as the hurricane last week, or a tsunami, actually we globally, as a human race, are very good at emergency funding. What we're bad at is day-to-day -day, uh, being decent to our neighbors. That's, some, that's something different. Um, but we are good at emergency funding. And that's really quite important because it's one of the factors. It doesn't offset power and power can never be excluded from this account. After all, why do we form we's? Oh, sorry, it's, it's gone down. Why do we form a we? Uh, it's to contest something. It can be political power, uh, it can be relative rates of pay, why are men paid more per hour for doing the same job than, that women do and are paid less. Um, it, it can be contestation about anything. And that's actually my def own definition of um, how social change works. Um, it works because everything is relationally contested. If one group gets a bit ahead, the group behind fights for this, fights for better rights, whether the rights are monetary, legal, power positions, new roles, whatever. This is what the morphogenetic approach that I've worked on for years is, is really all about. So it's never that power is irrelevant. It's even relevant in the junior school playground when one kid is boasting about its new bike or computer or whatever. Um, it stops boasting if a bigger boy comes and bashes us on the head for that. Um, society is preg impregnated with power. We think we're being so nice and polite, and actually we're all playing a power game, aren't we? The game of recognition and acknowledgement and all of that. Another book. Uh, so, critical realism has no problem dealing with that because really, if you want to cite a source for realists, it would be um, Hegel's discussion of the master-slave relationship. But the master-slave relationship on all sorts of dimensions. Um, so that was the, the main thing to, to say there. Do come back if you're not a satisfied customer, as they say. All right. Now, this was uh, also an interesting question because, yes, you're quite right that we cannot... Uh, I'm sorry, the lady sitting to, to the extreme left. Um, we cannot dissociate ourselves entirely from psychology, nor in the future can we dissociate ourselves from neurobiology, uh, human enhancement, and the, rival, the arrival of artificial intelligence. In fact, that is what my own social ontology group worked for five years, produced five books on social morphogenesis. Now it's writing about the we're on book three um, of a closed series on um, the future of the human. And we are indeed uh, discussing these things. But this is not an unbiased discussion, because if you go out there 
and get acquainted with the artificial intelligence literature. Uh, there is robophobia. It's there in War of the Worlds and the novels at the turn of the 20th century. H.G. Wells was there with his robophobia. What did Isaac Asimov do uh, half a century later? He wrote The Three Laws of Robotics, which were designed to protect human beings against uh, robotic excesses. Now, the interesting thing is that the, there is a contradiction between those who fear robots because they say they want to take over the world. Look at the movies. The movies are actually rather good on this, the Matrix um, movies. Uh, yeah, fine. You want to take over the world. Want is a word that applies to the consciousness. But you say these are just, um, you know, cleverly molded, pre-programmed, software uploaded pieces of metal, and pieces of metal are incapable of being conscious. Uh, they can't have it both ways. Now, I'm particularly interested in trying to develop an idea that humans and AI robots, I'm not talking about your um, you know, thing that gives you eight channels to complain about your broken down central heating system. Um, but I am talking about robophilia. Why can we not conceive of humans and AI robots being friends? Why can we not grant that there can be an emergence, an emergent property within the robot uh, that is a conscious quality. After all, when in 1995, was it? Um, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess. Are we saying that Deep Blue just worked through a series of algorithms and he was just lucky, and he came up, and he beat Kasparov. Was he not conscious of his strategy? Then when we move on three years, and we get to AlphaGo, and Go has, uh, I, won't, I won't tell you what comes to mind, because I may be misleading you. Go is a much more complicated game than chess, many more legitimate moves that you can make in it. Um, now, what is inconceivable about the fact which we can imagine, because I guess most of us, more of us play chess than play Go, uh, we can imagine how we would strategically, because we've read books on it, you know, the Sicilian opening in chess, or books of famous chess openings, uh, but these are selected. Now, how are they selected? Yes, uh, you can say pattern recognition, that they recognize that with that deployment by the opposition of their pieces on the board, that's when it's usually a killer to um, make the move that you're going to do. But that's, that's acquired knowledge along with the name of the person who invented that killing maneuver. Now, why should we not think that if an AI robot who is capable of learning, capable of self-adaptation, why should we think that it doesn't become a he or a she if it wants to, 
adopt that gender and um, feel rather pleased with itself that it's beaten the world go champion or chess champion. After all, what is feeling pleased? It's, it's another of these conscious things. Yes, I would eventually say that AI robots probably will develop full consciousness, perhaps exceeding our notions of consciousness. We don't know that. That's futurology. Um, but it's worth playing with because it could have some very beneficial effects for both us and the robots. Uh, it would make automatic cars um, driven on AI debate philosophical problems. They couldn't avoid it. If an accident is inevitable, they have to come back to the old problem put forward by Bernard Williams and many other philosophers. Do you kill one child or do you mow down five teenagers? We've never solved it for ourselves. Why should we not, why should we expect the robot to do any better? And yet people will say, I wouldn't go in an automatic car, you know, when they're available. They're dangerous. Yeah, so are we on the road. Um, so, you know, there's, a, there's an awful lot there that just isn't answered. And to come back to where you started, you made an assertion, now this may have been the way it came over to me, but you said, I think, put me right if I'm wrong, there are 11 dimensions of personality. To which my only reply to you is, who says so? On what authority? On the basis of what experimental design? Can they say there are 11 and only 11 aspects of personality? And then coming back to where we started, I mean, I, I couldn't actually spot a question. So my question was about measuring different kinds of uh, reflexivity or, you know, comparing it, how is it possible or is it reflexivity or not? I mean, for, for instance, reflexivity of uh, organisms, ants, bees, and also reflexivity of, of interspecies communities like uh, insects with funguses and okay. something, and you know, and also social reflexivity you know, on collective level. Non-human reflexivity. If uh, this can be addressed in uh, one minute. Yeah, 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 <laughs> your microphone back, because I want you to. Oh, it's okay. I've got one too. Uh, I wanted you to ask, answer something else too. Um, why do you say we we are in permanent cognitive dissonance on the basis of what? That wasn't you. Sorry. Sorry, it was the lady over there, wasn't it? Uh, okay, let's um, let's stick with that. Um, so, what what were you actually asking? The question about non-human reflexivity. I think he, he asked about non-human reflexivity. If reflexivity can be applied to other species than humans, that was the question. Yeah. Well, it's a very, very interesting one uh, because, again, we, we are back into this. Do we allow them reflexivity? Not the same kind as ours because ours isn't entirely verbal. Some of it can be visual and pictorial. Um, you know, if you are 
starvingly hungry and happen to like burgers, you don't necessarily say internally to yourself a sentence as long as, I am dying for a burger. You just picture a burger and you start salivating. Um, that's one that's in a book by Norbert Wiley, who wrote The Semiotic Self. Um, and there's, there's a lot of that. And just as I've argued in um, Being Human, that we cannot withdraw intentionality from animals, the cat waiting patiently outside the mouse hole. Well, what's it doing if it's not waiting for a mouse to come out? I mean, the eagle that is hovering up there, uh, waiting for some minuscule movement in the grass that it can detect that we can't, it wouldn't be doing that unless it was, there was some relationship between it hovering at T1, at T2, dropping down on the, the prey. So no, I wouldn't limit reflexivity to, to the human species. Um, later on, if we live long enough, we might find out some very interesting things about the pictorial, the tactile, and for dogs who can smell a uh, hundred times better than we can, that seems to be pretty well established. Um, why shouldn't there be a whole form of reflexivity that takes the form of smell? It's a very underrated sensory capacity of, of ours in the literature, um, but maybe it's time not to write it off any longer. Okay. Thank you very much, Margaret. Please join me in thanking Professor Archer for uh, this uh, excellent uh, talk and uh, our discussion. A teraz jeszcze tylko kilka bardzo krótkich ogłoszeń. Po pierwsze, trwa przerwa kawowa już teraz. Ona jest nie tylko na tym piętrze, ale i na trzecim piętrze, gdzie odbywają się obrady grup tematycznych za 20 minut i na parterze. Część z Państwa ma swoje grupy w części wschodniej stadionu. To jest około, to jest około, to jest około 8 minut stąd na piechotę i tam też jest przerwa kawowa, więc jeżeli Państwo idziecie na tamte grupy, można spokojnie się tam napić kawy przed obradami swoich grup, bo tam też będzie kawa czekała na Was. Sesja prezydencka jest tutaj znowu o godzinie 6.00. I to jest, to jest na parterze, nie w tej sali, tylko na parterze, w tak zwanej sali prasowej, oznaczonej na mapach, które Państwo dostali. Także dziękujemy bardzo, zapraszamy na kolejne obrady.